Various is the main architect of the Open Revenue Network, a new form of organization capable of delivering innovation to the market in an open and decentralized way. Very trendy. The OVN model is now replicated worldwide, is the subject of scientific research, and highlights the design of new economic and commercial standards. Tiberius co founded Sisorica in February 2011. He specializes in infrastructure, governance, methodologies for innovation and production networks, and in developing interfaces between classical institutions and the public at large. Tiberius, the floor is yours. Um, so I've been going around to different uh, to talks um, here, and I was uh, hoping to see someone talk about peer-to-peer -peer technology and institutional change. Um, and I haven't seen that yet. So we talk about co-ops and corporations, um, classical type or traditional type organizations. Um, so here we're going to see something new out of the box. Um, the, the French people here in France they have a, 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 a nice term to talk about a venture or Company. They're going in what, um, which, which means in the box. Um, and, and, and that's because um, when we see organizations, uh, traditional organizations, they're confined by uh, different parameters, uh, like number of employees, uh, budgets, uh, or the resources are finite. So, so this is why I think the analogy is perfect. Uh, now we're talking about networks where everything is crowdsourced. Um, so we're leaving the box um, and I think see the model. It's a new model for innovation and production. So essentially, um, Bitcoin is, is uh, uh, replacing the banks uh, for value exchange. We're trying to replace traditional organizations for innovation and production. Everything you can think of. Uh, clothing, chairs, computers, cars, things, um, and things else. Um, before diving into the model and understanding how this type of network operates, um, I'd like to uh, I'm a cool. I'd like to uh, to build some context uh, because this is a shift. Uh, um, it's a change in, in paradigm, um, and, and it's it's kind of hard to understand if you don't uh, understand the broader picture. Um, why are these people working on peer-to-peer -peer technology? Why am I working to develop this new model and and, and sensor for the past eight years? Um, why are these people getting a, a job, right, a, a proper job? And, and, and spending the time developing these new products and things. Um, if I have to summarize that in one phrase, is I think it's very the end of the age of greed. Um, we are in a system that encourages greed, and then, and then greed goes back and, and redesigns the system to consolidate um, that greed. So I think we're, we're at the end of that. Um, and, and here we're not talking about um, individual greed, we're talking about uh, greed that is systemic, that has global consequences, and, and greed that operates, and this is very important, in a transnational space um, that is beyond the reach of national and, and international institutions. Um, uh, we are at this point where, where uh, some damage to the environment and some damage to society is done, and there's nothing we can do about it um, because we are in a transnational space, a space that is beyond the reach of the state. And so why is this why is this age of greed ending? It's it's because greed meets within this transnational space and new force. Uh, this is what I call the rise of the multitude, the rise of, of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, movement. Uh, and the model of this movement is open and decentralized everything. So it's it's a, it's a quite a powerful and, and disruptive uh, objective. Now here's the multitude in action. Okay, I don't know how many of you know about, about the Occupy movement, creating a space of discussion and understanding how our financial institutions work, uh, which breed, uh, breed, right? There was this movie, Wall Street, a famous movie that shows the greed that is embedded in that kind of financial system. Uh, so, so this is the multitude coordinating um, throughout the planet to kind of expose how, how the system operates. Um, here are also uh, people coordinating uh, globally using internet technology to rebrand, to rebrand multinationals uh, that are causing environmental damage, um, that are causing damage to 
the well-being of the individuals around the world. So now this is this is not a force, this is not an NGO, this is this is a product. This is a this is a peer-to-peer um, network of individuals that respond to certain values and use the new technology um, to counterattack um, this this global and transnational greed within that transnational space. <clears throat> um, and from this action there's a reaction. So so multinational corporations they actually got it. They said uh, you know, they realize that, that we cannot operate as usual. Um, business as usual is, 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 not, is not possible anymore. It affects the bottom line, it affects the profits. Um, so so the, best, the best example of that is, is the fact that we are all here today talking about uh, corporate social responsibility, right? So this, this multitude rise or, or movement um, um, it's not a reaction to force, and this is very important to understand. It is actually a very, very constructive uh, force, and these are some, some labels starting in the mid 90s to now, um, just to get an idea about what, what this crowd uses and what are the building blocks or the milestones that have been, um, have been reached um, in order to sort of call it into this coherent. Um, of your type of, of, uh, of movement. Um, so in essence, the multitude is building a society to its own image. If we take away the labels, we see what this movement is made of. Okay? It started with free software, then we moved to open knowledge, open hardware, open currency, open society, open economy. So we remember the motto of this multitude revolution, which is open and decentralized everything. And I'm sure you have heard of the, the term open associated with a lot of our terms. Uh, but this is what it comes from. There's actually something very coherent that is boiling under the surface. Um, and, and I'm very surprised we're not talking about it at this, uh, this moment. Uh, <clears throat> these are the main, um, the three main important economic trends that we see today. So we spoke about um, the platform economy, and this is represented by what's on the right and what's on the left. So on the right, we have what we call the rise of platform economy. Um, this is essentially uh, incremental innovation, meaning we're using new digital technology but within traditional institutional frameworks. Okay? Um, and it's, it's the normal stuff. So you have, you have a platform that is owned by a company, a corporation, we're talking about private property, and we're talking about, uh, we're talking about uh, hierarchical governance. Okay? Now, two, three years after the emergence of platform capitalism, uh, there was a reaction from the left. Um, and, and again, there's nothing surprising and nothing new there. Essentially, the left said, why should we have platforms owned by corporations when we can have them owned by users, uh, by, by the score workers? Uh, so there's, again, uh, just incremental innovation using this new digital technology within in another type of, of classical traditional institutional form. Uh, the only thing that changes is you know instead of having private property, you have shared property, and instead of having uh, democratic uh, higher governance governance systems, you have more democratic governance systems. Uh, so you just go from corporations uh, to corporations. Nothing really new. What's really new and exciting, and this is where the excitement is of, of the young people. This is where the energy is pouring in. It's in the middle. This is where you find stuff like Bitcoin. Okay. So so let's analyze Bitcoin in, in terms of property and governance. Uh, you can see Bitcoin as a technology, but you can also see Bitcoin, the network, as an economic agent. So, it is a network, it doesn't have a legal share at all. It's made of individuals owning computers, uh, using the protocol, and together as an aggregate, they're able to provide a very secure and stable service to society, which is value exchange. Um, so it is a service that banks used to provide before, and now we can we can provide the same service with the same quality outside of these institutional support and institutional forms. Um, so who owns the Bitcoin network? Well, there's a bunch of individuals that own a bunch of computers, but one computer cannot offer the service. So so the, the service is an aggregate, is an emerging property of the entire network, and nobody owns the network. Nobody owns the network, nobody can buy the network, nobody can sell the network. Um, so we call that a non-dominion form of property, which means everybody has access to this thing. I can buy a computer tomorrow, download um, the Bitcoin uh, software, 
install it, and I don't have to ask permission to be part of the infrastructure of the Bitcoin network. Um, so it's open, uh, anybody can join. Um, nobody owns it, but everybody has access. Okay? And, and, and the governance systems here, we're talking about open governance um, and, and meritocratic governance systems. Now, <clears throat> you know, all these things, and this is where you see sensory. Okay, so we're slowly, slowly just starting to talk about sensory and putting it into this big picture. Um, this, is, this is an explosion of, of networks. Everything that we can think of, from education to media to innovation to production, um, they now have a network equivalent, which are in you know, different stages of development. And, and all these things are small. Even Bitcoin, everybody knows about Bitcoin, uh, but if you compare the, the number of transactions <coughs> that goes to this network, it's pretty small compared to you know, the traditional ones, like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and so on and so forth. The question is not how big they are. The question is how fast they grow and how far they will grow. That's the real question. What is the mechanism of growth of these things? So, um, I'm not going to give you my opinion because I'm uh, obviously biased, but I'm interested in the fact and you make your own, uh, you make your own opinion. Um, so, Bitcoin exists for the past nine years. Okay, that's, um, more than, that's less than a half of, of the lifespan of Google. Now, within nine years, um, the network has accumulated, aggregated, 500 times more computing power than Google. So, so not even half of the time of development, the peer-to-peer -peer in the collaborative economy gives us a recipe to aggregate resources in a much, at a much faster rate. Uh, so, this is you can't compare that with anything human beings have seen uh, until now. Okay, so the growth mechanism is extremely, extremely aggressive. And we also saw that other examples like the DAO, which is the biggest crowdfunding campaign in human history. Um, so they do have a fast growing mechanism, um, and, and so it, it's hard to believe that any one of these traditional uh, forms or uh, economic models can compete with that kind of stuff. Okay, so we have to think about the future of this, uh, this kind of organization. Uh, this is a busy slide here. Um, sorry for it, you don't have to, to go through it. Actually, it's not even mine. Um, we're at home sharing, so I just got it from someone in the picture. And, and essentially, it uh, shows you on top how the uh, internet has evolved and, and what, is, what does it mean for business, uh, business processes uh, at the bottom. So, when we talk about platform, uh, the platform economy, platform co op, and platform capitalism, uh, then I follow this path. Okay? Um, but something very destructive has happened, which is a fork in the internet. Now, the internet has a decentralized version. Okay, this is how Bitcoin operates, this is how Ethereum operates, this is how IPFS operates, and all the other peer to peer technologies that we're using as a backbone to, to build this type of organizations. Um, so, so, so it's, it's on this fork that, that the middle, the middle <coughs> economic development. Uh, Sensorica, uh, Bitcoin, and, and other things are created. So, you know, we're here talking about how to make the box better, um, how, to, how to make the corporations or, or companies more socially responsible. Um, one of the questions is how, how, how far these kind of um, um, forms of organization will go in the future. Um, what is the role? And, and in my opinion, they will morph into something else. Um, they will not disappear tomorrow, um, taken over by, um, by organizations like Sensory and Bitcoin, uh, but they will definitely have to morph, uh, they will lose a lot of their functionalities that are now, are now internal to them, uh, to uh, network identities, uh, and they will probably spe specify uh, or specialize in, in, in some important niche uh, function. So now let's dive more, uh, more deeper into, into Sensorica. Sensorica is the innovation and production of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Exchange. Um, there's, there's a strong brick and mortar component to the network, so we're not just software on the web, we're actually real people. Uh, if you want the equivalent with Bitcoin, uh, miners, which are computers, do the work for the network, they validate all these transactions. When it's Sensorica, the miner is me and my peers, and we're using our brains. We think about problems and, and bring solutions to these problems. 
and we use shared spaces which have a non-dominium form of property, meaning they're open innovation spaces like fab labs and maker spaces. Um, this is our place of work, and a lot of work activity happens in this coordinated online uh, as well. Uh, this is some of the projects that we have done. So again, since we exist since uh, February 2011, um, so we didn't just come out of, the, of our basement uh, today or yesterday. Um, so we have done um, the hardware development and projects with universities, uh, with companies, um, and also we have what we call endogenous innovation, uh, which are our own projects that we want to uh, uh, develop products, bring to the market, and distribute them to us as a uh, this is some numbers from our past years. Uh, our data shows that uh, when it comes to offering IT services to the traditional uh, organizations, universities and, and companies, um, our cost is, uh, is uh, a 60% reduction. And this is not because we're, we're um, sort of um, exploiting something in third world countries because we're a network and we operate online, um, but this is because our overheads are, are very, very uh, low and, and for other reasons. We go out of a mix that seems to work on innovation as well as innovation. So this is a little bit of the structure of Sensorica. Um, the Sensorica network um, is essentially just, just an open network. Anybody can join, anybody can, that can solve a problem um, doesn't have to ask permission. Can I solve this problem? Can you solve it? And document that you solve the problem and you're guaranteed a benefit from, from your work. Um, so, uh, all the economic activity happens within this open network. And then, in order to exist in our current society, we have to create some uh, sort of uh, interfaces. Uh, for example, if you want to sell a product or, or, or a service on the market, uh, we have to go through a, an interface. So, we create an ink, which is a, a shell corporation that you know, can do uh, invoicing and, and the um, but, that, but that is just an interface, that is not, the, the, the whole economic activity happens, happens within, within the network, which is, is, a, is a crowd. Uh, so a bunch of freelancers uh, that, can, that can come from, from anywhere in the world. Um, and then in order to interface with uh, government, for example, or um, in order to receive donations, we can create uh, non-for-profit organizations. We can create all kinds of organizations uh, that are traditional legal forms uh, to interface with, with the actual system at the periphery of the network. Um, this is an analogy with, with uh, um, Linux, which is the, the open source operating system. Uh, we have the Linux, which is the crowd that, that creates the software. Um, and then you have Red Hat that, that um, monetizes uh, this um, asset, you know, this, this comment. Uh, since working is built in a, in a little bit of a different way, uh, when we create an exchange firm to distribute a product or a service, it's actually an engagement from uh, this kind of this organization to keep back to the network uh, to all the participants in the project and pay for their contributions. So that's the major difference between uh, Red Hat within the Linux environment and that's its way. So we, you know, when we talk about networks and peer-to-peer, and -peer, we're not talking about just about chaos. People show up and do whatever they want, and um, so and this, this is sort of the things that the different levels of, of design of these kind of networks uh, to make them um, reliable economic agents. Um, so, so you know, you can knock on the door of a corporation and um, and have a contract with them to to offer a service or, or you know to do uh, to do some research for you, and and you know they deliver. You know, Months and they will stay within budget, but one network should, should, should behave the same, otherwise, you know, we have no place in the economy. Um, so, we have to work on all these, uh, these, these levels here, and this is the work we've done for the past uh, 80 years. Um, <clears throat> so, work on governance, uh, develop IT infrastructure, which we call NRP, Network Resource Planning. Um, we hear about ERPs, uh, Enterprise Resource Planning, all the companies use these kind of systems to manage their activities and their resources. Uh, well, we, have to, we, have, we have to build our tools from scratch, and now we're going on, on blockchain and, 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 and uh, whole chain and other peer to peer technologies. And we have to build methodologies of work. How do you work as a product? How do you, how do you approach the problem uh, from the beginning to the uh, end? This is an example of, uh, of the system. Uh, we have this Sensorica value network. So it's not a company, it's a, it's a network. We call it an open value network. 
and this is what the software does, the mind supply inventory, resource management, project management, etc. Uh, and, and we have these kind of forms where anybody in the world that works on a problem, they can they can they can log their time according to the scope the, 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 the tasks they do and the skills. Uh, somebody can invest money into this project, somebody can contribute some material resources. The system is building an economic ledger. This is what you have to understand. The same way Bitcoin, you have a ledger that is shared with all the transactions, the Zurich system builds an economic ledger where it is very transparent to see how everybody contributes to some, uh, to some projects. And then in the end, it is uh, a benefit, and I don't want to say just profit, uh, but it can be anything, it can be exposure, it can be uh, um, being recognized for something, reputation, access to governance, we see that we see as a form of benefit, uh, being able to make decisions for a project, or even revenue, financial revenue. Uh, well, we know how to distribute these benefits because uh, uh, we pull the data out of this, uh, this uh, uh, economic ledger. Uh, so we have here uh, an example of equity for all individuals, these are real numbers. Uh, that have participated in the project, and here you have a sort of a role map, uh, you know, already here you have the, sort of the, the roles that people have uh, and, and how they have contributed. So this is the way it works. Yeah, so, so essentially that's, that, that's it. Uh, so we have developed the, the governance and, and uh, methodologies of work and IT infrastructure to stabilize economic behavior and activity of networks, and we have it pretty <coughs> well done uh, eight years uh, down the road uh, to be very confident that, that one day uh, when you buy a car, it will most probably be open source and produced by a network and not, not by a co op or, or by a corporation. Thank you. Thank you very much for being this wonderful questions. Yes, well. If I look at your presentation and hear your presentation before that, the word trade union or labor union didn't appear at all. Because you're just an open network, not a network of people. So it then boils down to what is fair and what is balanced. Um, so what happens in cases where, where people might be disagreeing with something in the system? Or are you saying the system rules it because the system keeps all the information and so it cannot be unfair or unbalanced? And from that perspective, you know, something like a labor union or trade union movement, you wouldn't think of at all. <coughs> yeah, so, so the paradigm shift here is that uh, there's no more division between the ownership and executive and management. Um, of a company and work is just involved in it. Exactly. So, so people are getting involved and their contribution is logged. Uh, different types of contributions are logged. Um, so this shows how much skin the game you have, uh, how you participate in this project and this gives you access to governance, for example. Uh, so it's a very meritocratic system. Um, and, and yes, there are circles of governance to decide how the project goes, um, but, but the system is open and meritocratic. Anybody can take that role by just by working enough and, and, and contributing more. Um, so, so then it's a system that the people control. Um, it's, it's not a class system anymore. You're kind of part of that class. Uh, you know, it's not an elite system anymore. Um, anybody can. It's transparent, but it's uh, not transparent. But, uh, um, mobile. You have a lot of mobility in, in, in the system, right? Uh, so I don't. I don't. We don't see this problem yet. Um, what we're concerned with is security. Uh, these networks are precarious. The same way the value of Bitcoin um, fluctuates a lot. Um, you know, sensorial also fluctuates in terms of economic activity. So what happens when the project is finished um, and before somebody else in the network brings a new project? Uh, so we don't know how to do these things yet. Uh, we let it to the government because we still exist in the actual system, but now it's strengthened. To put in place uh, solidarity mechanisms or mechanisms of support. Can I just add to that? Um, I was thinking, you know, you've shown there are there are you know uh, customers that you want, you know, that use your 
say, form of, of work, uh, you have to stay in doing budgets or something like that. Somebody tells you beforehand, this is the amount. Deliver. Is it is that how it works? Uh, you know, yes, yeah, we can we can do exactly what uh, any corporations can do. Companies can come to us and say we have a fifty thousand budget and can you give us uh, a prototype that does this or that or solve our, our, our problems? Uh, and then we evaluate it and negotiate it and then we start from the thing. Um, and, 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 and you're being able to report it. Um, since we're building an economic ledger and all the information is transparent, um, this is real time reporting. Uh, and it's a different kind of trust relationship that you build with your client uh, because you allow the client to see how the resources are spent in real time, uh, in which type of activities and how fast the project advances. Uh, and, and if we uh, don't do a good job evaluating the project at the beginning, at least uh, it's pretty easy for us to go back and, and renegotiate because we show that how many stuff that we spent so much time doing this and that. Uh, so the work is transparent because we inherit from the open source uh, culture. So everything is documented, like open source stuff is documented normally. And then all the economic activity is very transparent, and the client has direct access to it. Um, in a way, I think it's a better organization because transparency, uh, you know, a transparent organization you can't hide stuff, you can't buy a lot of products, you can't um, um, have uh, uh, products built for program for obsolescence or, or scrub the environment in our products, everything is, is, is transparent. Uh, and, and people are responsible because they know that their activities are visible in real time by, by our clients. Two things. Why did this open vendor network appeal to you? Why did it appeal to you, this open network? Open uh, vendor network? It's, it's a pattern that we, that we noticed back in 2000. I know this back in 2008. Um, it appealed to me because um, because one of the things that was important for me was access to economic activity. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have people driving taxis uh, that come as immigrants to Canada, but people with PhDs driving taxis in the city uh, because they have a barrier to entry. These guys can get more girls, they can solve problems. Um, and, and within a network like Sensorica, uh, where work is transparent, where tasks are transparent, anybody can take a task and solve that problem without asking permissions and being guaranteed the benefit for that work. Uh, so, uh, for me, it doesn't make sense uh, to have so much brain power that is, that, is, that is not used because of these barriers to entry to economic activity. We have to get hired in a company. Uh, and the regulations, you know, I'm an immigrant and I, and I, and I don't have a work permit or, or simply I don't have Canadian experience, I don't have a network, uh, or I screwed up the interview because I can't present myself well. But I know how to solve the problem. Thank you. So it's, it's Any questions on this side of the room? Oh. Oui. Uh, je vous remercie pour vos interventions, c'est très intéressant. Par contre, je n'ai pas bien compris la fin la responsabilité. Où est-ce qu'il se situe dans votre organisation On voit que tout le monde est fait des choses, il a permis. Quand vous avez un produit à commercialiser, qui a la responsabilité de ce produit Vous avez des clients. Si vous avez un problème sur le produit, il y aura une impact sur la sécurité, par exemple. Qui est responsable vis-à-vis d'un niveau juridique, ou bien un niveau financier, etc. Comme le séminaire de la conférence parlait de l'organisation qui va transition vers la responsabilité, les deux, premiers, les deux interventions, on voit qu'en fait, l'entreprise ou l'organisation, elle se désengage de sa responsabilité. Dans le premier, chacun devient responsable. Et là, vous dites qu'il n'y a pas de responsabilité ou concrète. Il y a différentes formes de responsabilité, mais si on parle de la responsabilité des gars, de l'Ivan pour un produit, euh, c'est absorbé dans ces euh, formes légales traditionnelles interface, ce qu'on appelle des exchange firms. Alors on crée un link à travers lequel le produit sort sur le marché. Donc la responsabilité légale est là-dedans. 
euh, la responsabilité pour le projet, pour son, son propre engagement dans un projet, ça va par des systèmes de réputation. Les systèmes de réputation qui sont couplés aussi aux algorithmes de redistribution des bénéfices. Euh, qui responsabilise les vendeurs sur le okay. Qui responsabilise les mineurs à Bitcoin Ça fait partie du protocole à l'interne. Mais à l'externe, face au client, face à la société, ce sont ces, ces interfaces légales euh, qui est une façon de hacker le système pour qu'on puisse exister. Euh, mais qui sait dans l'avenir pour moi que les réseaux seront pour exister légalement, conforme, euh, conforme accepté par le gouvernement. Pour l'instant, on n'est pas là. On est en discussion avec le gouvernement du Canada euh, pour ce genre de choses. Euh, mais pour l'instant, pour exister légalement, il faut créer ces astuces pour euh, se donner ces moyens, ces outils. Thank you. I think that you want to say something. Yeah. First of all, I thought it was a very interesting presentation. I have to say that I share some of the uh, questions, concerns of people in the audience, obviously. But on one hand, I think it's a very interesting system because um, you're basically, it's a very democratic or democratic way of, of sharing the output of the process, right? Because what I understand is that everyone sort of receives uh, proportionally what they put into the in, into work or, or towards the project or whatever. My question is this, because you talk about algorithms and uh, to d determine who gets a percentage of whatever the final product. Uh, to what extent uh, do the participants in this platform, are they able to actually negotiate the sort of what goes into these algorithms? Uh, because indeed, there's no union. And this is sort of uh, decided another way. I think it would be interesting uh, still that there's a way for workers to collectively uh, have, a, have a say on how they want that to be distributed. So I'm interested <coughs> in if that's being done. And also I would like to know how are they <coughs> being categorized? Are they all classified as self-employed? Can they choose to register themselves as they want? What is the responsibility for workers to even register their work? Um, uh, or, or not? I'm, I'm just curious to know how this, you know, this is treated in the regulatory environment. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so I start with the, the second question. Um, for now, everybody is a freelancer within the network, and uh, we're thinking about implementing. Um, Another sort of interface, another legal structure is smart, which is making the workers co op and allow people uh, to be part of that co op if they want. Uh, and now they can benefit from social benefits. Right? Um, but again, this is another legal structure at the periphery of the network, and the status of these individuals will change globally um, you know, to a worker in a co op. Right? Um, so that's that's another hack that, that, that we can that we can afford. Now, for how the benefit is redistributed and and um, what we call benefit redistribution algorithms, in Bitcoin is fixed. It's part of the protocol. Um, you know, the amount of computing power that you put in gives you 